everybody uh, to this public lecture, uh, which is taking place as part of the PAST 21 conference. Uh, I'm really delighted to welcome our speaker, Dahlia Conde, and Dahlia is going to talk to us about exploring and mapping data landscapes to rescue species from extinction. So this topic goes to the very heart of the theme of our conference. Uh, it's about examining how we can harness the power of exascale computing, big data, and machine learning to tackle what is really a global challenge uh, of uh, biodiversity loss. Our speaker, Dahlia Conde, is an associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark, and she's the director of science at Species360, which is a data-driven conservation NGO. Dahlia is widely published in some of the best journals in her field, and she's a passionate advocate for uh, data-driven solutions for the biodiversity crisis. So just before I hand you over to Dahlia, let me just remind you that if you have questions you would like to put to her, you can do that by typing them in the chat. And then at the end of the lecture, I will be happy to put those questions to Dahlia. So without further ado, let me uh, hand you over to Dahlia for our public lecture and what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating discussion. So Dahlia, please. Hello, everybody. I just want to make sure you can see my, my screen. Let me just, uh, here it is. Well, first of all, it is a great pleasure to be with, with all of you. And thank you so much for the privilege to, to present to this to these audience. Um, and, and I want to start uh, to mention that I don't want this to be a very depressing talk. Uh, despite what, what is happening right now in terms of, of the biodiversity crisis. Uh, I really think we're still in a very good time to make big changes in, in, in what we're seeing on global trends. And I believe that this community has, is, has key tools, but as well is especially positioned to, to, make, to make a huge contribution to change um, what this, this extinction threat trends that we're, we're, we're looking at right now. So, so first of all, what are, what, what are the, the, the extinction drivers? What, what are driving so many species to extinction? And usually uh, we talk about over harvesting that, 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 that we see either with, with fisheries or, or other types of, of use of natural resources to, for example, the, the illegal wildlife trade uh, that are really, really decimating populations, uh, even if they still have habitat left or, or, or good areas of habitat. As well, we have deforestation and, and habitat fragmentation of, of a species. Uh, and these habitats, when, when, when you start making small fragments and separating these fragments, uh, they become isolated and they don't have places to, to move. So that limits their capacity to breed. Uh, that creates what we call inbreeding depression, that they start inbreed with, within close relatives, and as, as well that drives um, a species extinction. Um, pollution, uh, invasive species, when we move a new species into, into a, a new uh, habitat, um, in which they start thriving, but, but, the, but, but the native species didn't know evolutionary how to cope with that competition and they, they become extinct. And of course, all this is magnified by, by climate change. Um, as, as, as you may know, we have had five mass extinctions in our planet. The last one was with the, um, with the extinction of dinosaurs in the, in the Cretaceous. But right now, the rate at, at, at which which were losing a species, we can compare it to what we call a mass extinction, a six mass extinction. What means that the species are becoming extinct at a rate that is not natural. Of course, there is natural species extinction, but there are extinction that it doesn't matter how fit you are in, in evolutionary terms, you, you become extinct. And if you see this graph in the, in the x-axis, we can observe um, the time interval of, of, ex of, of extinction. 
And in the y-axis, we can see the cumulative extinctions, which is a, a percentage of the IUCN, which is the International Union of Conservation of Nature, that they have been evaluating how many species have been becoming extinct and which have been the trends. And we can observe that overall, since uh, we, we can count different extinctions, but since the Industrial Revolution, we see a exponential growth in the number of species that are becoming extinct. Uh, we mentioned the different drivers of, of, of extinction loss, and, and we need to think that a lot of these drivers are, are the results of very complex mechanisms. It's not only about how fit the species is to deal, but our, 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 our push and are the result of social factors, economic factors, um, um, biological, climatic, they are all combined for which if we want to reverse the trends, we need an integrated approach. We need a multidisciplinary approach, but as well, we need a multilateral approach. Uh, many species, they don't respect borders. It doesn't matter, especially when we talk about migratory species. Uh, pollution doesn't, doesn't respect borders. Climate change doesn't respect borders. So it's very important that that we keep in mind that, that a multilateral approach is, is, is essential. For these, there are many organisms at the United Nations, like the Com Convention of Migratory Species that deal with these, with these uh, uh, types of issues, uh, the Convention of the International Trade of Endangered Species that deals with the trade of species globally. And, and all these organizations rely on data to make decisions. The problem we have is that species data is really hard to, to obtain. And, and we have biologists all over the world that are com com gathering data across species, either with um, going to the field, we have citizen science, we have all these different databases in which you uh, can obtain data to develop different analytics that can help to make decisions to make sure that a species do not become extinct or to have policies that can help manage those species to under habitats to, to prevent its extinction. I, I was a field biologist myself, and, and I had the luxury to work in the Mayan forests of Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala. This is, this is with, with, with my colleagues when I was doing the PhD. And the Mayan forest is the biggest rainforest in, in the Americas after the Amazon. It's a very important forest that was practically not totally deforested, but very impacted by the Mayan civilization, and it came back. And, and doing field work was not, was not easy. We, we work in very remote areas of the Mayan forest. We have to buy a lot of supplies. We got not very good vehicles that, that sometimes we, we had to rent or get someone to bring us all the supplies to, to, to the Mayan forest. Um, when we had luxury, we had a tent and we work in, in really fancy conditions like here. And we spent two, three months in the jungle. And, and sometimes we, we, we had the luxury to be in, the, in this, in this um, little uh, palapa that was in the, in the protected area. But sometimes we have to hire people and build, and build palapas into the middle of the forest where we could uh, hang our hammocks and be ready to, to collect data. Basically, what we were trying to do is to collect data on, on, on jaguars. Jaguars is, is a big, the biggest cat in the Mayan rainforest. And is the, is the of, of the big cats, is the most unknown. We almost do not know anything about the big cat. Uh, this is a reminder, if you do a PhD, don't do the PhD of the, of the least known cat. It's, it's a big challenge, but it's terrible for, for a PhD. Uh, because gathering data is, is a huge challenge. We had to train dogs and have dogs that, that, that help us to trace the jaguars. Um, it sounds very romantic, but most of the time we spent our time with, with flat tires and getting really, really muddy. I took the picture, so I'm not in the pictures, but I was there. And, uh, and once in a while, when you're extremely lucky, uh, by 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 the um, by dawn when when by six in the morning, you catch a jaguar and and then all the work you did and all the effort you put is absolutely worth it. 
you get the jaguar, you see it, uh, you put a color. Um, and here is here is uh, my husband in the back. He's handling the, the GPS collar. We take different vitals. There, there were, the, it's not only us. There was a very big team of people. There were people doing veterinary analysis, geneticists, because once you have the chance to, to capture one of these animals, you want to take as much information and data as possible. I just want to tell you where I was working. So I was working in the Mayan forest, which is in the Yucatan Peninsula, this is Florida for everybody, and this is uh, Mexico. So the Mayan forest is in the Yucatan Peninsula and is between Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala. So we share between borders. Um, the area of the Mayan forest we work was, was across the borders. This area has become extremely dangerous because a lot of the cocaine is traffic and, and is a smuggle either by boat to Florida or through the, the, the Mayan rainforest to go to go through through these borders. So, so well, I have a lot of stories why, why I'm now working in data and I'm now working in the Mayan forest. I'm one of the of the whips that when one of our our team crews was kidnapped by 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 drug dealers. Um, at that time I was pregnant and I decided I was going to, to start working with data, but it's not only because of that that I'm working with data. I hope to convince you why. So this is this is a, a satellite image of the Mayan forest that was taken in 2001. And what you can see is in pink is what is deforested. And this is the, the protected area where you saw our, our Palapa. We were working exactly here in the Reserva de la Biosfera de Calakmul. And, uh, and, this, is, um, and this is where we work it. Oh, sorry. So this is where we used to work. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going too much ahead. So, so, so what I want to mention is, is the work we were doing and all the challenges we had is not only us. There, there, there are so many field biologists that are working with so many species all over the world, really trying to map, to track, to understand the biology of these species. And, and a lot is for the advancement of science. But, but when you are in the jungle and you're seeing what is happening, it's, it's impossible just to think about the advancement of science when you see the level of deforestation and you see the number of animals that are getting hunt, for example, or 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 um, or all the all the all the trafficking of of uh, different animals that is happening in in in, in these areas. Um, still, collecting this data is essential if we want to understand species and understanding the biology and the science is essential if we want to create management programs to save the species from extinction. So I really love this, this map from, from David McCandless. He has a book that is called Data is Beautiful. And I really like this, the way he map how you, how you go from, from, from data that all these people collect I call him the wild. He doesn't give this example. I'm just using his his drawings, and how you go from all these Excel files you usually collect in these in these notebooks. Of course, GPS they go into satellite, and we get it in, a, in our computer. But how you organize this data and classify it? But then there is a lot of people that are really structuring these data in in databases, in a standardized databases. One of the biggest problems we have is that the world of biologists and the world of computer science is too is too apart. So the methods that people are using to structure and standardize data is really, really um, old fashioned. Um, then we have another group that are already getting all this information that is already structured and they're linking it. And we have some, some, some different uh, databases that do that. So what we, what we decided is, okay, we have all this data, but we don't know how much do we know for every species in the planet? How can we map this knowledge? And how can we, in the future, develop a system to monitor how knowledge for a species in the planet is growing? How can we monitor this knowledge? So we started with a very simple exercise to integrate different databases. And we did it for, for, for terrestrial vertebrates. Now we're expanding to fish and and and, and um and, and other areas of knowledge. This was just knowledge on 
fertility and mortality, which is which is the maximum lifespan, which is the liter size, the clutch size, etc. That that type of data that is essential to to do a species management. So what we did is we got all these different databases that are all um, separated and integrate them and standardize us. We had to standardize taxonomy. Taxonomy is changing almost every day, it's awful. And, and we're not working with viruses. Now that I'm working with virolo virologists, it's even worse. And then what we did is when you integrate all this information, we, um, we map it. And this is a map we have, as you can see, one every pixel is one species. And what we did is we develop an index of knowledge. The dream is that this index of knowledge will be alive and that we can have a center where all these databases are continually integrated, plus develop a series of analytics for which we need a lot of computer power. And all these analytics, we can start knowing how, how all this knowledge is changing for, for all these species. We can see huge knowledge gaps for, for amphibians and, and reptiles, as you can see. And, and still for mammals and birds, what we see is the pink that we see, the top pink, is where you have the highest level of knowledge that you need to develop a population viability analysis, which is forecast how the population will react to environmental conditions or to harvesting, hunting, et cetera. And, and we calculated that we have this for only 1.3% of all the species in the planet. We're talking about non-domestic species, wild species, which is really low. However, given the extinction crisis, we cannot wait to continue until we get all this knowledge. We need to find ways to fill these all knowledge gaps. And we can fill knowledge gaps based on different uh, assumptions, biological assumptions, borrowing data from closely related species, um, doing different types of simulations, but we say, what if we use data from zoos and aquariums? So we saw that if we use data from the same species that is in captivity in, in a zoo and aquarium, we can increase our knowledge into 15%. Now, the next challenge is how can we compare between zoo and wild? Because the conditions are very different. So we can really use that data, borrow that data to apply to wild species. So, so this is a big question that, that we need to we need to we need to resolve. Um, but but the issue is not only about uh, survival and fertility. We need data on genomics. So we need to connect with GeneBank. We need data on locations. Locations, the Global Information Facility has data on locations. So there are all these different databases that are all spread and separated all over all over the digital world that we need to interconnect. Yes, we have a lot of data gaps, but we still have a lot of data. And the problem is we're not harnessing all this data and integrating this data and developing models to understand how a species will react towards different interventions we can do in order to assume the best, the best, the best management practice if we want to save a species from extinction. But if we go back, this is this is the area where I work it. And this is 2001 when I started uh, with my with with my with uh, my research and work in the region. And I want to show you how is now the deforestation. This is 2018. So I want you to see these patches. You know, we wanted to develop corridors between all these patches. You can see that the encroachment. Look at this. How the encroachment is growing and how the, the patches are becoming more and more reduced. And we're almost only having the protected area. And even within the protected area, deforestation is growing. So, so this is not only about the biology. We need to put a, no, a lot of other factors. And in these factors, it's very important to put measures, for example, that, that consider the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals in terms of uh, poverty, uh, instead in, in ec economics, road investments, development, different different uh, issues. Uh, we need to put the international trade, which legislation exists. So we need a lot of different types of data in order to be able to support the decision-making process. And of course, you can think, okay, this is a lot of data. Where do we start? And how can we connect this data to make, to make, to support these decisions? So I'm going to give you an example of a project we're, we're, we're recently working on and for which 
Um, I'm not going to get into the examples of how I think your community can help us, but but I'm sure, and I have and I have some examples that we can discuss about on how how especially the community that is coming to this conference can make a huge a huge impact. And if we go to to this image again. If we see deforestation and if we see what is happening is more encroachment. And this is happening not only in the Mayan forest, this is happening all over the world. We're having more and more um, access to forests. People are having more contact to, to, to different species. And this encroachment is making us be in more contact with wild species that we were not in contact before. Um, if we put these together with this, um, this access to the forest as well provides access to harvest more species, for example, for the international trade. Uh, this is a, a picture I took in 2018 when I was in Bangkok uh, working with, with a nonprofit monitor who were doing a survey of the illegal trade in, in, in a market. A lot of the species you see here are not captive bred are taken from, from, are from the illegal wildlife trade. And, and this encroachment, of course, makes us be more in contact with species. But if you make these species bring to these markets, I just wanted to show, if you see in the bottom of this picture, um, you see this very, very small, cute primate that they're selling. Sorry, I forgot the name of the species. Then you see different, different animals here. So you have a combination of different animals. And in the bottom, you can see the, the, the plates of the people that were eating. So what I want to, to bring you with this photo is to say, we're not only getting a lot of animals from all over the world, but we're in high contact with them. So this is a key, or this is like a perfect Petri dish for emer emerging zoonotic diseases. And we're going to, to COVID. Um, to COVID-19 and why I, I'm not having the pleasure to give in this talk with all of, all of you in person, which I will have really love. And over, on top of this, we I just want to show you the diversity of the species. You can have species from the tropical rainforest of Mexico, Belize and Guatemala, which is this Aramacao, up to the, fenet, the, the ferret fox, which is from the sub-Sahara Africa. So you have a species from all over the world. A lot of these species are not legally traded, so they don't go with the health requirements and they don't go through the proper channels. And we have an immense network of trafficking roads, routes, and this is what we know. There is a lot that we don't know, not know. This is from the US, it was published. A lot of these data comes, there are a lot of police agencies, uh, including uh, US, including uh, Europol, Interpol, um, um, so a lot of police in, in, in Southeast Asia, China, that they're all are working together in order to understand where all, the, all these hotspots of wildlife crime. So this is, this is a map of, of trade routes. So if you can see, uh, a lot of these emerging zoonotic diseases, at least 70% of these diseases come from animals. And of that 70%, 65% come from wildlife, which is not not um, domestic species. So if we see the impact we're having in the environment and we see the number of movement we're doing in these species and in the conditions we're mixing species in these markets, it's not a surprise that the number of emerging zoonotic diseases has increased a lot in the last, in the last, um, in the last 50 years. So, so now we're working with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime they have um, a wildlife crime unit. And they're really, they're really focusing on how wildlife crime can drive or can be a vector of zoonotic diseases and how can we implement new methods to do it. So the first thing we did was to, to say, okay, if we want to support UNODC and especially support them on how they can help to this treaty. So now the World Health Organization is is in discussions that it was already accepted uh, just in, in May uh, this year, that they're going to make a decision to have an international treaty on pandemics. The international treaty on pandemics, what we were, we were surprised is that is really focusing 
on early detection and prevention of pandemics, but they talk about uh, uh, as well about the One Health approach that I will go over later. But our idea was how can we work with, with UNODC to help to see how the, the, the wildlife crime can, can be a vector of these diseases. So what we did is we worked with the WHO blueprint report diseases. Why these diseases? Because we have hundreds of thousands of zoonotic diseases, but we wanted to only focus on those that can cause an epidemic or a pandemia for which a cure does not exist. And, and these are the, the diseases that, are, that we are at high risk. Then we wanted as well to integrate the, the, every data we had on these diseases, which, which expenditures on research and cures every country is the, is the voting. Then we wanted to know which species we know they're host of the viruses, especially if we have PCR and, and serious analytics, because now there are hundreds of thousands of papers on COVID. So we wanted to make sure, okay, how, how reliable is the information that these species can be a host of these different viruses? And we wanted to know, once we know these species host, how much they're represented in the international regulated trade, which means the legal trade that is regulated by the convention CITES, this convention on, on is a UN convention, and which ones have been reported from the illegal trade in confiscations. Of course, confiscations is not a whole picture, uh, because that depends on the ability of the country to, to do them, but as well, uh, and, their, and their resources to have those confiscations. So you can be a country that has all the will to, to do a confiscation, but maybe you, you don't find any. So, so, so there are many factors in how the illegal trade can, can be measured. Uh, based on these, these are some of our preliminary results, and you're the first to see it. And what we found is we found that for the zoonotic diseases that, 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 that we're analyzing, you can see it is from Kobe, Ebola, Zika, all these different diseases. Uh, these ones are, are virus, um, all of them. And we found that the only hosts are mammals and, and birds. We don't find amphibians, reptiles, or other, other classes. Of these ones, uh, working with the University of Liverpool, they have the Enhanced uh, Infectious Diseases Database, which is continually updated. Uh, we found the number of hosts, and is more than 400 hosts for, for, for mammals. And of those ones, we were, how many are, if you see these lollipops, you can see that 91% of these 33 species that have been found to, to, to be possible hosts of, of COVID. 91% uh, uh, are in the regulated trade by CITES, and 67% has been found in confiscations in the last 10 years. Uh, what we found is quite, quite interesting because from our results, we can see that it's a high proportion of the species that can be carriers of these diseases. But but as well, what we found is that it's not an overwhelming number of species that can have these diseases. The other interesting thing we found is how much investment has been done um, since 2004 in these, in these diseases. Of course, COVID has been now. And of course, the vaccines we're having for COVID, the, 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 response of, of the fast response of the vaccines is because there was a big investment of 52 millions in MERS and SARS. These are COVID viruses. And the investment in, in COVID and SARS really, really gave us a heads up to, to, to have the response of the, of the vaccine we're having right now. So we wanted to have to know, notice which is, the, which is a research expenditure. Now, what, what, is, what are the next steps? Well, the next steps is how can we, how can we, we understand more about the biology, the habitat destruction, all these different drivers of, um, they're putting all these species hosts of, 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 of these diseases. Um, we, we need to understand them. But if you see, they're focusing more on early detection and prevention of pandemics. So if we can model all these networks of the illegal trade, if we can use, um, if we can develop good analytics and algorithms to, to do this and to understand the interactions between diseases, we can really help 
to early de de detection and prevention of pandemics. We will not detect everything, but we can have a, a, a good plan. Now, in terms of the One Health approach, I, I believe this is this should be key one because that's tackling the source of the project, the problem. Sorry, and the source of the problem they talk is environmental health, which we, we, that's what is driving a species uh, from extinction. Of course, animal health and human health. But what I'm what I'm sensing is that is that this part of of, of environment is not is not totally not totally um, develop and many countries and, and, and the health, the one health approach usually is more reactive than, than trying to prevent from the root cause of the, of the problem. So, so in this sense, we think that, that by integrating for only these species that we know are carriers of these key diseases, if we can develop further knowledge, knowledge mapping about everything we know about them, their habitats, deforestation, um, virus they carry it, et cetera. And we can interconnect this knowledge in, 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 in this landscape, not only on digital knowledge, but in this in, 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 the, in all the connections of the legal and illegal trade. I think we can develop very, very important models in order to help this new, this new um, global initiative to help prevent a next, a next pandemic. Um, so in this sense, as a biologist, how do I see your community? Well, I think your community is the next is the next there is the next frontier of exploration. We 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 still exploring, of course, a space, but but in terms of what we have right now, and, and our planet, if we want to preserve a planet in which we have a good way of life, in which we continue to have oxygen levels, we have the potable water, uh, pollinators, all the different environmental services that these species provide for us, we cannot wait to generate more, more knowledge. We really need to harness all the existing knowledge. We really need to use new algorithms to be able and, and harness all these data integration to fill up knowledge gaps in the best way. And, and using that integrated data and integrated approach we can really start supporting policymakers and start pushing the frontiers to advance uh, a species conservation, but not only a species conservation, our, our health in, 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 in the planet. And with this, I want to, to thank you so much for the talk. And I know we have, well, I have a lot of questions for, for, for you, I think more than, than you have for me. And, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Dahlia, for a, a really fascinating, thought-provoking and ultimately hopeful <laughs> um, lecture about species and uh, biodiversity. And there are certainly some questions in the chat, so maybe um, I'll just have a quick look there. Um, so one question that came in actually um, shortly after you started was about deforestation. So of course there's been, and you showed us the effects of significant deforestation, but in other areas on the planet, there is regrowth or, or uh, reforestation. Um, so is that a sign of hope? Um, what, what can we learn from that? Yes, well, absolutely. And, and something that I, that I want to mention is we always talk that, that, um, that extinction, we, we are the drivers of extinction. The current extinction is not a meteorite that, that crashed like it was a meteorite in Chipchulup that with, with the dinosaurs. Um, in this case, it's us, and I think that is what gives us hope. Because if us were causing this, this catastrophe, we can revert it. So, so yes, yes, there are many places where we're doing reforestation. Um, it's still areas like the Amazon, which are key areas of, 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 of rainforest and biodiversity. We can see what, what has happened in this last uh, period, uh, unfortunately um with with uh, with all the fires that have been happening in, in the Amazon has been terrible. So so we can we can revert it and, and there is hope but but it's still there are many many countries in which in which is very challenging to, to to change those those policies. Sure. Um 
second question, which is actually sort of there's a nice discussion happened in the in the chat. I don't know if you were able to see it, but it's about genomics and and the role of genomics in uh, estimating species populations. So, do you have a, a view on that? Is it how useful is it, um, or uh, is it used in the databases that you mentioned? Yes. Well, genomics is is is. The area of genomic is incredibly important. Uh, there is the Air Genome Project, which is a very big project where, where the goal is to sequence all genomes of all species on Earth. And that's a very, very important project. Uh, I have, I have the, the privilege to sit in, the, in, in this group. We meet, we meet once a month. And, and yes, genomics is is very important because they can help us to understand how population dynamics were for species in the past. We can see some species, their populations were always small. Some species were through different fluctuations. Genomics as well can help us a lot to manage species uh, from extinction. There is now a lot of projects that are uh, cryobanking where they're extracting life, life uh, cells. And those cells are being stored and, and preserved alive. And from all those cells, for many species now, you can create sperms and ovules. ovules. So, so this is not cloning. This is the opposite of cloning. How can we save cells to preserve that diversity, genetic diversity, that you can then, like a memory stick, you know, you go to the field and then you can, you can um, make, um, you know, um, um, artificial insemination to some, some individuals and, and with a little bit of, of new genetic material, those species can revamp. So, so genomics and, and the field research of genomics is extremely important. And of course, not only for that, but as well for research on, on, on emerging infectious diseases. You know, the interaction between species and, and, and which, which, which is what WHO calls disease X, which is the next disease that, that may appear. So, so that's a very important topic. And yes, we're trying to integrate with, with that data and and especially to, to help the Air Genome Project to prioritize which species we need to start doing those genomes. That's fascinating. Um, I, maybe just remind people that they can still put a question in, in the chat for you. So uh, since I, I don't see another question just at the moment, I, I'm going to use the time if, if you don't mind to ask one myself. So I, I was thinking when, when you mentioned the mass extinction events, I, I presume there's a huge amount of information available through fossil records that, and, and are people already applying machine learning and data analytic techniques to that information set either to uh, develop uh, ideas or to understand the data or to learn from it? Is, is that something that's already happening? Yeah, it's happening, but I think a lot much more can be done. And, and, and I really see different areas of, I think that would be a, a very nice future panel discussion on, on, on maybe some experts on these different areas and how can, we, how can we pair these different areas of research with the computer science research? Because the way we're doing things in, in our field is, is very limited. Of course, there are things you can do right now, but it's like in, in, in the past, you can of course, put data records in paper and 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 we we're advancing. So so yes, there are models to understand past extinctions and how a species responded and be able to see if we can understand future as well. How a species will respond in the future based on those on those models. Yeah, exactly. That's that's sort of what I what I was thinking would be a really useful, really interesting uh, question. Actually. Yes. And there is a lot of data. GBIF has a lot of data um, right. of, of all these museums that have all these records from the fossils where they found it, et cetera. And that's openly available, that data. OK, that's really yeah. interesting. Um, so on that note, there's a related question, I think, that follows nicely uh, from, that, from that discussion. So for a young researcher in the field, in, in HPC, high performance computing, what would you recommend them to get involved with to start in the conservation effort? So what can they do? I think is maybe. Oh my God, there are so many projects that you could do. Um, <laughs> and actually I wanted to write about, about possible projects we, we could launch. And, and, and unfortunately I, I, I didn't have the time, but I think to, to be honest, I think 
is, is, is an enormous niche that has not been occupied by computer scientists. And, and it can go for what you mentioned in, in the sense of, of, of mapping past and using machine learning to understand past extinctions and be able to model future extinction to, for example, where we're, where, where, for example, to, to map, okay, all these, all these, all these changes networks uh, on, 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 on the, from, from habitats to all these networks on, on, on the illegal trade. You know, in, in which you need to do a lot of simulations, you need to do a lot of assumptions, you need to understand, you need to use a high amount of data, you know, because you use airplane data, uh, you know, all the airplane connectivity, all the connectivity between different types of transports. And so it's using a lot of different types of data in order to say, okay, what is the probability to finding a seizure given all these things and what we have found in the past? And that's something that nobody has done, to my knowledge. And, and something that I see is that there is a very big need in my field of, of really starting connecting more, more with this community and, and bringing applications, you know, applications, applications to, to this. So, and, and of course, in the area of, of genomics, there, there is a lot, a lot, a lot to work. Uh, people are working with, with, with zoonotic diseases as well, new, new families of viruses, uh, modeling how different mutations and, and different types of, of viruses can emerge from different combinations of species. There is, there is a lot. Although my area is more on the, on the, on the geographic and, 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 and trying to understand all these links on, on sonotic diseases and integrated all these different biological, biological data. So I think I cannot give one response, but I think it will be very nice to, to have like maybe a panel discussion of different people working on extinction things and see which are the connections and the needs, uh, because I'm only one voice of, of so many. No, I, I think, well, I think it's clear that there are lots of um, areas in which the, the skills that, um, that many people in this community or this conference have would be really useful. So, um, yes. Yeah, so yeah. Lots, lots for, uh, for young HPC researchers. And to and just one one of the things, for example, we have movement bank. For example, all the movements of the jaguars. Um, if you understand the landscape and you understand the movements, you can do a lot of computational models to understand, you know, to generalize those and do simulations to understand where can we build better corridors, where can we. Uh, so so it's it there is a lot, yeah. So, so somebody in, in the listening is also reading my mind because uh, they, they've asked a question I was thinking as well. So how do you tackle the issue of standardizing and combining all of these different types of data? Yes, well, that's, that's, that's one of the biggest problems we have. And I think there is where we will need um, possibly machine learning algorithms to, to start training the computers to really do this, this standard, to, to learn how to do this standardization. Um, one of the biggest problems we have is that a species taxonomy is changing all the time. So when you want to integrate different data, you need to, to understand the taxonomy each one of them use. So that's, and although there's some, some packages to integrate the taxonomy, I don't think these packages, um, they're very basic, whether we could develop well, we, not me, but you could develop packages that, that if you work with taxonomy experts can have machine learning algorithms to understand, you know, all these different errors you can find when you integrate the data and these changes in taxonomy. So I think that will be, that will be a very important, something like that will advance not only species conservation, but all sciences, because we have to integrate when we do comparative biology or evolutionary biology, you compare across many species and you integrate data. And that's one of the biggest problems we have. And of course, now that I'm working with virologists, I thought I had a problem with, with, with mammals, bird, reptiles, and amphibians and fish, but, but no, they work with viruses and the taxonomy of viruses is even worse. So, so, so now I, I decided not to complain. And the other issue we, we deal is to integrate data on on vocabulary. So, for example, some people call maximum lifespan in one, in the other is maximum age, you know, things like that. So, so we have done it in a very simplistic way. We build our own, what we call the standard translation tables. I don't know how, how you call them. 
and and it's very very rudimentary what, what we're doing right now is very rudimentary and i know i know there are much better ways to do it and i guess it's quite time consuming as well and uh, um, and just personally intensive in, in is is crazy time consuming and doesn't give us time for the things that you know to do, to 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 assess decisions to assess all these other things because a lot of the people spend tons of time just just cleaning merging data and doing all these things by hand that if we could use machine learning algorithms it will it will go much faster so i i don't see any Further questions in the chat, so I, I might finish with, with just one, maybe for you. Um, if you if you have, you know, if you could, uh, what is the one challenge that you see um, that might be within reach for your community that um, really would have significant impact on species extinction? Do you have one project in mind that um, that really is what you would like to accomplish? Well, I think I have two, but I'm going to think of one. That's okay. Two is fine. <laughs> well, one will be one will be to to be able to integrate all these different data between between a species that are host of these diseases. You know, the ones that that pose a bigger mm -hmm. challenge. Integrate these data with data on their habitat, data on their on their um, biological traits, data on their genomics, data on other viruses they carry, etc. Together with all the information on 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 the train to develop different types of models, different types of models of do we have a, a species that is more you know in different conditions that is more traded, where are the prices to trade it? Does it mix with other species that could have similar viruses that can mutate, how this will happen? So, so I think a project integrated all this data that, that combines a species extinction with, with zoonotic diseases and with illegal wildlife trade, I think will be a very interesting um, project in terms not only of, of, of the challenge of, of of data integration, but of the challenge of the analytics that you need to develop, and how can you make make this something that is that is that is running constantly? Because these networks are changing constantly, you know that the, the trade networks are, are changing constantly. But as well, we have new information on new diseases, on new viruses, on new. So so I think that will be I think that will be a challenge that will be important to reverse extinction. But that will have a lot of attention because it's under this one health approach and people will feel more more close to it so i think that that will be that will be the the challenge and that's that was a challenge i wanted to 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 sit down and 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 and, and really 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 work through every every step well thank you so much dalia i i think that's a, a great place to actually to finish <laughs> our discussion with the with your call to arms i think and uh, i think would just like to say thank you for such a really stimulating, fascinating um, public lecture. It was really wonderful and uh, I've certainly learned a lot and uh, have lots to think about um, as a result. So very many thanks indeed. No, thank you for having me and and, and I hope to, to meet you once, all, all of you in person. Well, hopefully at the next PASS conference. Yes, I would love to. <laughs> so I think uh, with that, Having thanked Dahlia, I just would like to say thank you to everybody for uh, staying on this evening to listen to the lecture. I hope you enjoyed it as much as, as I did. Um, before I close the session, I would just like to remind our conference participants that we start again tomorrow uh, in the mini symposia, but importantly, uh, the voting for best posters will finish, will close tomorrow at 11 a.m. So please do visit the virtual uh, exhibition center look at the posters and cast your vote for the best poster before 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Okay, so with that, thank you very much to everybody for joining. Thank you to Dahlia for a really wonderful lecture and I wish you all a very pleasant uh, evening and see you tomorrow.